Hyperbolic PDEs look similar to elliptic PDEs in that they contain second partial derivatives of the dependent variable with respect to two independent variables. However, the methods for solving them are more like the methods we used for parabolic PDEs because typically one of the dimensions is time and that means they're usually formulated as boundary initial value problems. Recall that when we solved elliptic PDEs, we solved them assuming we had boundary conditions at both the upper and lower bounds of both independent variables. When we solved the parabolic PDEs, we had boundary conditions in one dimension, the x dimension, and an initial condition in the t dimension. In this case, we'll require two initial conditions in the t dimension. So while we have boundary conditions for x, we have initial conditions for the dependent variable at time equals zero and the partial derivative of the dependent variable with respect to time at t equals zero. Therefore, this is also a boundary initial value problem. The way we've defined it here, the boundary conditions in the x dimension are Dirichlet conditions. And the initial conditions in the t dimension are a Dirichlet condition and a Neumann condition. We'll solve this using the same general solution that we used for parabolic PDEs. In this case, like the elliptic PDEs, we need to replace both second derivatives with three-point central difference formulas. And that results in a five-point molecule. This finite difference approximation represents the three-point central difference formula for the second partial derivative with respect to time in this direction. And this three-point central difference formula for the second partial derivative with respect to x in this direction. This finite difference equation can be multiplied by k squared and solved for u at i j plus 1. If we define the parameter r tilde as k alpha over h squared, that simplifies the equation. And future values of u in row j plus 1 can be computed from previous values of u in the j minus 1th and jth rows. This will be stable and convergent if r tilde is less than or equal to 1. However, special care must be taken when starting the procedure. When calculating the first row from the zeroth row, we require knowledge about all the values of u in the minus 1th row. But the minus 1th row represents the values of u before time 0 and we don't have information about what happens before time zero. However, we do know the partial derivative of u with respect to time at t equals zero. So we can write a two-point central difference approximation for the first derivative to obtain estimates for the unknown points outside the domain before time equals zero and substitute those into the equation for u sub i at j minus one. The function g here represents our initial condition on the derivative of u with respect to time. Once we've computed all of the u at i for j equals 1, we now have enough values to compute u sub i at j equals 2, u sub i at j equals 3, and so on. Chapter 10 of the methods text introduced some notation and definitions for describing partial differential equations. And we considered three different categories of partial differential equations elliptic PDEs, parabolic PDEs, and hyperbolic PDEs. When developing solutions for elliptic PDEs, we assumed that we had boundary conditions corresponding to known values of the dependent variable at all points on the boundary of the domain. This enables us to write equations for all of the interior mesh points that can be solved simultaneously. We found that this could be done using the Gauss-Seidel method or it could be reformulated as a system of two tridiagonal sets of equations that could be solved using the alternating direction implicit methods. We talked about doing this for both Dirichlet boundary conditions and Neumann boundary conditions, and we also discussed how to modify the finite difference equations when we have irregular boundaries. The methods used for different types of boundary conditions and irregular boundaries can also be applied to the other types of PDEs. When solving parabolic and hyperbolic PDEs, these are typically formulated as boundary initial value problems. Since we don't know the 
values of the dependent variable at the upper bound of the time dimension in either of these cases, the solution methods can be unstable or lead to non-convergence if the domain is not defined properly. The Crank-Nicholson method was introduced as a way of alleviating the convergence and stability constraints for parabolic PDEs. Hyperbolic PDEs can be solved similarly to parabolic PDEs as boundary initial value problems, but require some special consideration for starting the procedure.